Today, we're going to do something really cool. Uh, you probably have noticed we've got two bar stools up here in, instead of one. And uh, the reason why is because Johnson is going to join me this morning. Uh, Johnson Dorn. Johnson is uh, uh, on staff here with us. He's a senior leader among our family. He's uh, the pastoral one among us who really helps to watch over uh, the local body of people here and is a tremendous counselor. He's an amazing gift to this family to this house and he's an amazing gift to me and to Tammy as well him and Sharon and uh, their son Griff and those grandbabies that they brought into your world him and Katie so we're just super thankful for them but Johnson and I have had an unbelievable nine months of ongoing dialogue and probably some of the most beneficial conversations I've ever had have been the conversations he and I have had and we thought this morning uh, ending 2020, launching to 2021, one of the best things that we could do is maybe just kind of let you in on some of that dialogue as we, he and I just kind of go back and forth. I want to hear a lot of what the Lord has been saying to him and sharing with him. So I'm going to kind of interview and facilitate and jump in there and he's going to question me and I'm going to question him. And we're just going to kind of let you eavesdrop on one of those phone calls uh, that sometimes go for hours. So brace yourself, but we're just really excited. We're stirred. We're honored uh, that Johnson is a part of what we're doing here. And so I just want to welcome him to come. JD's going to come. He's going to sit with me and I'm going to give him a little space on the table. He doesn't need as much as I do. Um, he memorized the Bible and all of these different translations. So he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't need that, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to kick it to you quick here. Um, but, but it, it's, um, I don't think there's, it's like a protocol thing in my heart as much as it is just the reality, um, of what a gift our relationship is to me. And the way that um, we've been able to process this shift in consciousness by way of dialoguing with one another. And I don't believe I would have gotten there as quickly or as deeply without the gift of this relationship and uh, the, the vulnerability that we share with one another. You, are, you outside of Apostle Aaron and, and Tammy and Dutch Sheets, you, you are the safest place in the world for me. And I bring my vulnerabilities to you and I bring my hurts to you and I bring my questions to you. And uh, there, there are times I'm riding down the road and going, now, which one's the father here, uh, him or me? Because I've, I come to you with so much of that. And we're very, very, I think we're both really comfortable with being able to, to love and play those roles. But your wisdom and your heart for us, your, your vulnerability, I think, has helped move me into some space for vulnerability. Um, but we have these conversations that, that go on for a long time. We, and, and we go through phases where we might have three of those in a week, and then we might have a week or 10 days where we don't have one of those conversations, and then boom, we jump back in, and they just become life to me. And so many times I'm thinking, man, somebody should be recording this. Some of the things that the Lord pulls out of you, and, and you pull out of me, and I pull out of you, and how the Holy Spirit just orchestrates all of that. We, we find ourselves in our own little perichoresis moments where we're dancing in the circle and he's sharing those whispers with us. So I want you to just jump in this morning, share where you're at. I'm going to keep my pen handy and, and jot some notes. And, uh, we, you know, to say to you, don't, the, we, don't, we don't really have a time frame um, here. So we're just going to share. And if people want to tune out at some point, they can. So, uh, but, but just really, really stirred about what the Lord's been downloading to you, especially, especially from a pastoral perspective coming out of, such an unbelievably interesting, challenging year and launching into a new one. So just share with me where, where you feel like the Father has you. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. I mean, I could, I could sit here and, and take the next 10 minutes just to talk about our relationship and what you have meant to me, thank you. to be able to be seated in the place that I am currently right now is largely because of where you've chosen to walk and the authority you walk in, first of all, just as a son of Yahweh, yeah. but also in the apostolic role that I know you function in here that's enabled me to have an environment of government mm. to be able to now, I feel like I'm walking into my fullest expression wow. of beloved identity. Wow. Awesome. Um, there's, I've thought of a thousand different ways to try to start this morning. But can you find that quote about abandonment again? I the sure one can. that you this, absolutely and just read that again because that that hit me again to the point of tears a while ago, and I feel like there's something there that, that needs to be unpacked. Okay, uh, one it, it unpacks a deep place for me, but I believe it, it's vital for where a lot of people may find themselves. 
The assumption of separation fuels the anxiety concerning abandonment. The assumption of separation fuels the anxiety concerning abandonment. If I were to be the most vulnerable to you and to you this morning, I would say that assumption has been my assumption. And, and I would go so far as to say it probably took this year to unearth it with a clarity that I wasn't sure was still there. In fact, if you'd asked me a year ago, where are you in terms of uh, this abandonment thing? In other words, he and I have talked a lot about there are two ends to the continuum of a false consciousness of God. One is this, this, this polarity on this end where he's going to get me. He's, he's vindictive. He's, he's, he's going to punish me. Yes. Uh, I'm damned to hell, which is more of an issue yes. you've struggled yes. with. The legalist on the side. Yeah. opposite side of that is this sense that I've carried most of my life, which is I'm on my own. Yeah. That, that if he's here, he's a disinterested God right, at best right, right. and uninvolved in terms of a day-to-day -day basis. And I when you said that this morning, I went, that has been a fundamental presupposition mm. that has been lodged in me that I really believe it has taken this year and all of the circumstances of this year to bring that thing out into the full light of day. Again, I thought it already happened. I've gone yeah. through a cancer diagnosis 13 sure. years ago, yeah. gone through some other crises where I've, I've known that's been an issue, but I thought it was dealt with. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, back in March, we stumble into this thing, and I can see this dark cloud of a pandemic coming. And, and to be quite honest, I felt a vulnerability mm -hmm. in that this year because I went, I'm 60 years old. I'm not 35. I'm not 25. I feel like if that had happened to me 20 years ago, I could have yeah. gone easily. Well, that won't affect me. That right. won't really bother right. me. But then all of a right. sudden, I began to see uh, uh, a target, mm -hmm. you know, that if you're over 60, you're particularly vulnerable to mm -hmm. that kind of, uh, of disease. So it scared me. In, in a way that I don't like to confess, don't, right. don't, didn't want to admit, but I, I kept trying to push that thing under the table. Hmm. But I, I've realized this year it wasn't going to go away. Right. And thus it forced me into a place of having to be able to, 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 to lay that presupposition, that assumption of separation yeah. that has fueled a high degree of anxiety mm -hmm. off and on in my life. And to get that thing out in the light of the day has, has been a huge, huge uh, place for me to go. Yeah. And a place that I, I, I to, again, to be honest, that there's been a lot of resistance about it. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I keep wanting to take that and just do this with it. No, okay, sure. let's push it away. I'm good, I'm good, yeah. I'm good. But here's the surprising thing I found, that as I've been able to be absolutely transparent with Yahweh about that fear that 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 this thing could get me mm -hmm. that then it led me into my highest degree of enfolding and 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 brought that assumption out into the light of day which was the thing that was really separating me You're right and then helped me see once it was there then i could realize there was this level of enfolded love that was always there, that's always here, but that assumption created a, an, an imaginary, if you will, wall sure. of separation between my heart and his heart. Now that that thing's come to the light of day, and at the end of 2020, now I'm again 2021, I feel like I'm in the highest state of hope because I don't have to uh, pretend that, oh, I'm good, I'm yeah, really good. Yeah. I can say to him, okay, here's this thing. Mm -hmm. Here, here's this assumption yeah. that, that something's going to separate me. Yeah. And now, and then once I'm able to do that, then, then this happens. It's the father once again, waiting. Johnson, I've just been waiting for you yeah, all exactly. along yeah. just to come to me so that we can deal with that frequency issue mm -hmm. that's creating a lot of noise for me and has created a perception or a consciousness that's fueled and rooted in abandonment. Wow. Wow. And so in, in this year, it, I realized that, that, that that's been a huge piece so for you me. Can, so you, you, then, then how do you process or how do you maybe categorize the past year except to say hidden within this pandemic was this great gift yes. that caused the surfacing 
of some things that, you know, we talked earlier, we, we were talking during, during the uh, worship set this morning, we were talking about the difference between optimism and hope, which has been a big thing in my heart as of late, and how you can, as long as everything's sort of going along in the direction you want it to go in, you can just stay hyper optimistic and assume that that's hope. But when things are not going in the direction that you would like for them to go in, and you have to deal with the fact that there is some anxiety in me, there is some fear in me, there are, there are some theological presuppositions that maybe he does do abandonment and maybe some of what we've optimistically believed is not what rea re what in reality exists that then I think I think looking back at the year and and not going optimistically it was amazing it's have no people that I know and I and walk with, have walked with and I'm close to have died this year that should not have died this year people who did not have underlying health conditions and were not in nursing homes so that's not a true narrative if that's the one that you're believing because i have multiple examples one this past week of someone that i know is very close to a spiritual son and daughter of mine who passed away that was extraordinarily healthy didn't have all of these issues and th and that individual passed away so we're dealing with death we're dealing with loss we're dealing with tragedy and in the middle of it Abba is giving us a grace to make a total, absolute, complete shift in consciousness as it relates to the nature of God. And, and would we have gone there? Would you have gone no, there? I would not. There's just, I just know I wouldn't. Um, I don't think it would have come to the surface in the way that it's needed to come to the surface for me to kind of finally... Let's put an X on that thing's back and get it into the light of day. Yeah. There, there was a, a, I think in the, in the absence of a crisis, it's real easy to hide mm. a dimension of internal darkness and, and have the luxury of just kind of keeping that thing at bay. But when you're all of a sudden put into a, a situation, and I think that's been a cultural thing that's happened this year, and Cor thus there's absolutely. a cultural opportunity that this, this, this piece can now be trusted, as you and I were talking earlier, fully into the light in such a way that light will cast out the darkness. Right. If I can simply put this place in me fully into the light, then it's dissipated. And, and that's what's been the miracle for me right now is to go, wow, right in the middle of this when I have felt the most fragile, I have felt the, mo the, the smallest at times I've ever felt, uh, uh, impotent at times. You know, I've right, talked about a right. lot about how, gosh, I have felt like my praying this year has accomplished nothing yeah. in terms of some real tangible results, but it's yielded a greater surrender, yeah. which then all of a sudden now has begun to dissipate a level of darkness that was easy to hide, mm. that now, now that's gone. And thus I feel uh, in the depth of my being a proximity now and, and with that is coming this greater perceptual shift yeah. that, that, that the abandonment that I thought was a given was an illusion. That's there something you you've, you've mentioned yeah. a number yeah. of times in your, in your yeah. teaching, but I'm really seeing that happen in my own heart and, and seeing the veil of that thing lifted up in such a way where I'm like, you've been here all along, mm -hmm. but I've not been able to perceive that. Yeah. And thus yeah. it took the pressure. It's interesting when you study anxiety. Uh, particularly, I, I think a lot of it, I, I think the New Testament uses a word or it uses a number of words that really get to the core of anxiety, but really it's a way of describing pressure. Pressure, yeah. It's that sense of inner constriction. Yeah. And then what that creates. And then when that can be enfolded mm -hmm. in perfect love, here, here's my testimony. It dissipates. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, and it's interesting because I said this, Back when, right in the latter part of the revival in Kannapolis, I came back here. Yeah. I don't know when it was. It was on February the 2nd, 2020, 02022020, which is spelled the same way backwards and yeah. forwards. Yeah. And I remember standing in here, and there weren't many people here that Sunday morning because everybody was in Kannapolis. And I remember saying to the group here, coming out of that weekend, this was right before the Hephzibah word came forth in okay. you, but we were on the yep. eve of that. Yep. That's right. And I remember saying something to the degree of, I find myself now in the most expansive place that I've ever stood on the inside. Mm -hmm. I felt like there was this expansive, large place inside of me that was beginning to breathe deeply in a way that I had never had before. Mm. And I described it as an expansive place internally. Well, a month later, we're in the pandemic. Right. And then I feel this pressure. Yeah. 
Yeah. I feel this amazing. But as I've learned to surrender right in the spot of the highest yeah. pressure, yeah. that then all of a sudden that enables enfolded love once again to come around and to dissipate that thing. But the challenge has been to be able to stay in that and right. not retreat to right. this. Oh, I got to hide this thing. I got to, right. I can't, I, I should be beyond this now. I'm yeah. 60 years old for crying out loud. Sure. Why am I yeah. still struggling with this? And it's like, no, 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 this, this is a journey sign. And, and if you can s- continue the surrender, this canonic thing, yes. continue the yes. surrender in this place, then, then what you saw back in February was legitimate, was real. And now through the pressure yeah. of 2020, let's say, I hate it that at the end of the year, I watched a couple of newscasts and a lot of the newscasters were saying good riddance to 2020. Yeah. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. And if anybody out here is going, well, I'm glad we got 2020 behind us. So let's just get it behind us so we can get back to what we were doing. We'll miss it. We'll miss it. And I know, yeah. I know that's what you've been doing. We will that's, miss. That's right. The opportunity of the pressure. Yes. To take us to a place. If we can simply surrender in the middle of the pressure then I, will, I think we will see something of the efficacy of go. perfect love that can only manifest if in that moment I will simply go, here I am, yeah. versus putting that mask on. Well, I'm good, brother. I'm doing all right. Yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm just going to get up and we're going to pray a little harder tomorrow. Right. No, that did not work for me. Yes. But, yeah. you know, to be able to just go, here, here I am. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, just to feel the power of that enfolding in a new way. It's just been, mm. that, that's kind of where I love the year's that. ending. I, I love that. I, I look at the, the wisdom of God and the strategy of Kannapolis uh, coming out, going into 2020. Our statement in 2019 was what you do with what you hear in 2019 will determine what you see in the year of 2020. We get to the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. We go up to, a, for those of you that don't know, we go up to a spiritual son of mine's uh, church in Kannapolis, North Carolina, Bryn Waddell and his wife, Jen, Pastor City Revival. And it had become sort of an annual tradition that we would go spend New Year's there. We would bring, we oversee uh, uh, quite a few churches from around the country and one up in Canada and some elsewhere. So, and, and we would bring those groups together and kind of bring the family together. Bryn's got a much larger sanctuary than we do. And we stepped into that thinking we would have a few days and it turned into a few months of just a real strong strong outpouring of the spirit some of the most impactful meetings i had been in and they all they revolved around this idea of finishing the exchange they revolved around this idea of the last hairline fractures of the heart the isaiah 61 luke 4 declaration that jesus has come to preach the gospel to the poor and to mend the brokenhearted and to deal with those hairline fractures in the heart that kept us from the kenosis from the canonic posture of being able to empty self to the measure that we could be re-identified as Hephzibah, one in whom the Lord delights and allow that light of delight to come into us. The beauty of that was for me now, that was so important to the Lord that the way he jealously guarded that was by using this pandemic as an opportunity for us to be able to do nothing other than sit with that Hephzibah revelation and determine if we were going to allow the light of what he was saying to us to really penetrate versus these meetings are blowing and going. People are flying in from all over the country and different parts of the world, and we're just going to keep rolling And I think this was too important to him. And I don't, you know, carefully saying, I probably don't have to, but to carefully say, I don't believe God calls the pandemic. I don't believe God is behind the pandemic. I don't believe the pandemic is the judgment of God in any way. However, you know, God, uh, as Bill Johnson says, he can win with a pair of twos. And so whatever hand he gets dealt, he's able to bring us into a place of victory. And I know that's what's been happening for me. Much of the, whether it be the eschatology or the theology or the doctrinal certitude that had been fading away for since really since 2009, some, some of it my whole life, really, because uh, people who know me well would say I've been grappling with these questions from be- be- before, I, you know, I was old enough to know what the questions were there was something in me that knew there was something more of God than the theology I had inherited through the impoverished lens of the western church impoverished lens of the western church so I've been you know and and it's where the statements begin to come out that were 
Um, we must come to receive the grace to unlearn a version of the gospel that has been at best tainted and at worst poisoned by the influence of the legal orientation of impoverished Western theology. Had, would we have gone there to the degree that we've gone there? And now what you just said about the efficacy, I, I even want to see 2020 through the lens of efficaciousness. And so to, to be able to look back at 2020 and say, we didn't waste that opportunity we didn't go through that and go la 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 when's it going to be over and now that it's over let's get back to business as usual put the put the dancing chicken back on the stage and get the smoking lights going again the show must go on the circus has to continue where are the dancing elephants and, and we miss that what god actually gave us was an a season where we would be immersed enough in beloved identity that it would create a re-imaging of god that would create then a fresh representation of who that God is to the culture. And if that's what we come out of 2020 with, then I think we'll look back at all of the resistance and we'll be able to say the restrictions on how we spent our time, the restrictions on where we were supposed to go and not supposed to go. We ended up going ahead and saying, we're going to accept that as a gift we're going to flip this thing on our adversary and we're going to say we're going to come out of this not broken and not defeated and not hopeless because I think, I think you know, the polarities of you and I, which is the, the, the legalistic bent, for, bent, bent that's just probably versus the liberal bent. So the liberalism nor the legalism brought either one of us the answers that we wanted because you, can, you have this austere, disinterested God who can abandon. I have a God who is meticulously watching, watching over every detail to decide how many times he's going to smite me, how, ba how bad the smiting is going to be, how bad the whipping is going to be, and how many licks I get are based on how much I misbehave. And I was in line for a lot of licks, you know. And so, yeah, but it led us both to the same spot, which was hopelessness. And now that th that is being enfolded into the light of perfect love, perfect love is casting out all fear Fear carries with it the anticipation of punishment. The individual anticipating punishment has not yet been perfected in love. So could we be, I mean, is, is it too much to say we are being perfected in perfect love to the place that there's an authority that we're going to operate in on the other side of this that we would not have gotten to otherwise? One of the things I heard in 2019 was a rehearing of Ephesians 3.19. That yeah. you may know the love of Christ, which surpasses, surpasses. knowledge, yeah. Yeah. that you may be filled with the fullness, pleroma, mm -hmm. the fullness of God. And the English really doesn't do justification to the image because the word surpassed is the word hyperbolos, which is where the word we get the word hyperbole, which okay. in English means an, an intended exaggeration. Wow. But literally in Greek, what it means, and here's where I, I didn't see this year ago, but now after yeah. the pandemic, I'm realizing through what we're going through, what I've gone through, what we're going through, through this pressure, now rooted and established mm. in the love of Christ, that same love is now posturing to hyperbolos into a place it could not have if we had not gone through it. And the word hyperbolos literally means to throw you uh. beyond. Yeah. So casting out fear, throwing yeah. fear, which is vital yeah. because, because fear has this, this, this hypertensive kind of quality to it that pushes you yes. down. So yes. it, 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 it inhibits loft. Yeah. It, it inhibits which the Which is ascent. a way you described in the beginning mm -hmm. your process. Exactly. Push it down, try to put and it. Exactly. It's yeah, a beach yeah, ball right. under the water. Exactly. It's going to pop back it's up. Going, yeah, I, yeah, I tell yeah, people yeah, that in yeah. counseling all the time. I say, listen, you you talking to me like you've got 20 beach balls under the water and, so, and they're popping up right now. Yeah. And our, in, our reflexive <laughs> response is to push the beach balls down. Correct. Well, this has been a year you can't do it. Right. And I, I would say to anybody that you, if you're still trying to hold theological beach balls now, mm -hmm. what's been neat to watch you which has been, as I described to you, it's painfully beautiful, the level of transparency he has, has exhibited for us this year is those old beach balls, just, yeah. and you didn't try to hold them down, which yeah. I think required a tremendous amount on, on you in terms of transparency, but it gave us the permission to do the same thing, 
to say, I don't, have to, I don't have to believe that anymore. I don't have to hold on to that theological construct. I don't even have to read the Bible the way I thought I was right. supposed to have to read it, that right. now I'm being brought into this place. And here's what it's done for me. I, don't, I, I was hearing some of this language a few months ago, and I've talked to you a little bit about it. And I thought at first, I said, man, this sounds awful academic. But then the Holy Spirit, I really felt like I said, no, 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 this, this sounds academic. But it's really a way of describing what love is doing now. That, that what's, what got finished for me this year was I saw prior to 2020 that, that certain ways in which I thought you would come to know something, which to me had been primarily yeah, this way, yeah, yeah. could only bring me so far. Right. But what I'm seeing now is that love knowing gnosko, gnosko. which Just I've even come up, right I've here. even come up with my yeah. own word, yeah. agape, agape gnosko. gnosko. I've got it written right here, yeah. agape gnosko. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which now, the only way you're going to get thrown into this this place of of the fullness of hope, mm. which is something we've been on now six years. Absolutely, the, one of the first fruits of the of the revelation of the goodness of God was the hope yeah, that, it, that, yeah. it, that it gives us now, six years later. Hope that cannot disappoint. It yes. can't. And, yeah. and, and, you know, in that whole verse, for the love of God has been poured out on us by the Holy Spirit. Yes. So it's the love knowing. Yeah. I, I can't get to where we're going by intellectual ability. Now, and you've said that a lot. This is, not, this is not for the intellectually gifted. This yeah. is not for the smart. This is not for the talented. Right. That we're only going to get to where we are now, where, where the love of Christ enfolding us can throw us. And so in my most extreme moment of vulnerability thus far, hmm. I found a level of enfolding that's beginning to throw me in the last week of this year oh, into a place I've, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. And it's just, I, I'm excited yet I'm, I'm aware of the pain yeah. that, that's going on yeah. all around yeah. us. And, I, and, and that's another thing that's happened to me this year. Is, is Yahweh taking me to a place of being touched with the feeling of that? Right. As have you. When yeah. you start thinking about the people who are really suffering, um, it, it leads you away from a well, brother, they ought to be doing. And when it, when, it, when it finally hit me, no, this could happen to you. Right. You, you could be taken out by this. Yeah. And so how do you respond to that? It just took me deeper into this place now that I'm, I'm like, only love. Only love is going to throw us mm. into this place. And, and the efficacy of the love of Christ, which has, and the, the Passion Translation said, the limitless love. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's got me excited. Well, that, you know, if, it's, if it is the perfect love thing, if we're being perfected in love, then I think it required us to deal with the imperfections of our consciousness concerning the love of God. The, the way we saw the love of God had limitations to it. And if this is the limitless love of Christ, then I have to deal with theological assumptions. And sometimes those become more academic than you or I would like for them to because we despise academic posturing. But I do think that there are, there are certain lenses that we're being able to apply to this because of the years we spent theologically being trained. But I think most of that was to learn how not to see this, not how to see it. Um, and so there's, there's been a lot of gifts that have been given to us in that. I, I, I specifically want to, I want to help people uh, sort of navigate time a little bit in this season. And I think one of the things that's been important for me is that we don't just go uh, 2020 to 2021 because that's the Gregorian calendar's influence of 2020 to 2021. For me, things shifted in March. And I think it will be March that we will come back around to the full circle. And I, I am in faith. I know other people prophetically are saying other things, but I'm in faith to believe that we will begin to get back to a sense of normalcy, but I don't want to get back to a sense of normality in that. I, I, I want to be able to, you know, walk down the street without having a mask on. I want to be able to, to go uh, enjoy, you know, the dinner at the restaurant and people feeling safe and, 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 and m probably most for me to see these hospitalizations drop and people that are not on ventilators and ICU units are not overwhelmed and overloaded. I'm ready, I'm ready to see all of that change shift. Uh, still praying about that as much as I'm praying about just about anything else right now. Um, but what I'm, what I don't want to see happen is I don't want to see us come out of what we just came out of without the spoils 
without the victories, without the treasures that the Father wanted to give us, without uh, some of the imperfect ideologies concerning the love of God, having to face an immersion into the actual perfect love of the mystery of Christ that brings us into the fullness and wholeness of, of who we were designed to be. So for me, I've been, I've been making myself continually stare at a couple of ideas. One is that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That the Father, Yahweh, Almighty God, ready, is exactly like Jesus. And, and I get, then, then I'll, I get the people who have a problem with me using the word exactly. But it's the exact word Hebrews 1.3 uses when it says that he is the express image of the father most translations say exact representation and it's literally that if you've seen me you've seen the father the next leap in that which is review of course but i think it's essential is that now god loves me with the same love that he loves christ and the holy spirit is making that measure of fatherhood real to me that i don't see myself as one who was not in the family and who has been adopted in but it's a weothesia adoption it's a placement into who i have been all along because i came from this perichoresis circle i'm finding my way back to this perichoresis circle and now all of my image of who god is and, and i don't i'm not i'm I, you know one of the things i taught at the university level for years was a survey of Old Testament. And so I was, my scholarship had a lot to do with Old Testament. The problem was I took people who had never seen Jesus and I trusted that they had a perfectly correct image of the Father. So I took Moses' image of who God is and said, that's absolutely right. And of course, Jesus is the perfect image of the Father. So let me reconcile those two instead of letting those two collide and recognize that the Bible never says that what Moses thought about God was exactly right, what Abraham thought about God was exactly right, what Job thought about God was exactly right, what Isaiah thought about God was exactly right. All of those predated the perfection of the exact express image of the Father made manifest in the person of Jesus. And I want to take everything good and right that uh, th that Abraham, that Moses, that Elijah, that Isaiah, that Job experienced about God. And I want to force that into confrontation with who Jesus shows us the father actually fully exactly is. And that's where some of the imperfect love is being judged in my heart because I'm not trying to reconcile Job's perspective with what Jesus presents. Those two things don't have to be reconciled in my heart because the Bible does not teach me that Job's interpretation of God is exactly correct. Whoa, wait a minute now. Now, I know, I know the kick, see, you know, because you come from my world, the kickback that that brings with people who are going, no, 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 it, the, 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 Bible, the Bible says it. The Bible, does, the Bible tells you that everything written about God in the Old Testament by way of the perspective of people who had an Adamic nature, who had never been regenerated or received the baptism of the Holy Spirit to make the fatherhood of God real to them, their perspective is 100% correct, and so is Jesus's, and we have to reconcile that. I'm just not there anymore. And in my heart, I'm going, let's take the lens, and I, and I don't like the language, but, but it's, I talked to you about this for two straight days now. I don't like the language because Jesus is not just the lens into, into God. Jesus is God. But we have to put on these Christological, you know, as, as a theologian friend of mine says, we're breathing Christological air. So uh, he, he, he's the creator and sustainer of all things. I think we have to put these Jesus goggles on and go, I refuse to see the father outside of that. Jesus is perfect theology. Anything you think you know about God, you can't find in the person of Jesus. You have a right to question. You have a responsibility to question. I, so, so taking this as this year was a year in which we were being enfolded into a perfect love we had to face some real imperfect circumstances and situations to cause us to reevaluate some of our thought processes. We needed some repentance.
We needed some metanoia. We needed some shifts in paradigms and what the Lord has done in that in my heart and he's doing in you to be able to say the last week, the last two weeks has been a, a re-entrance into the expansive place of the 2nd of February 2020 when you thought you were in an expansive place, but it was relative. So I, I, I want to let you talk about that, and then I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll share some things about restriction. But I know you've got some things there on Mariah. There's and just so much that I can play off that you've been saying. Um, Jesus as the incarnation of the Father. And we talked about that briefly. Yes. yes. That's huge. And it's, it's, you began a few weeks ago to start talking about yeah. the incarnation. Yeah. And yeah. you said, I got a lot yeah. more yeah, I really do. want to say I about do. that. I do, yeah. And I, and I really want to hear that because I, I mean, let me say this. Let me say this about incarnation. Uh, I'm using the word enfleshment, which, which is what incarnation. And let me tell you why I'm using the word enfleshment. And then you continue in that vein. I'm using the word enfleshment because when I say incarnation, people immediately go Bethlehem nativity. If I say incarnation, people think Christmas, Bethlehem nativity. All of the 33 and a half years is incarnation. All of the 33 and a half years is enfleshment. All of the 33 and a half years is entrance into the plight of Adam's illusion. Adam's mythological God, as Athanasius would say, at the mythology of Adam's belief system was, had infected Abraham, it had infected Moses, it had infected Job, and Jesus falls completely into our plight in order to bring us out of that. And now he didn't drop Adam off in hell. Okay. So that he could be resurrected and seated at the right hand of the father. And you and I would be free from Adam because Adam's getting the punishment he deserves because he should never ate that apple. It's, it's nonsense. Right. I can show you four specific times in scripture from Daniel to revelation where the one who is seated or standed standing next to God is the son of man that he literally took the Adamic nature into the place of enthronement and he fully redeemed the failure to tell us die. He fully finishes the illusion of Adam so that you and I could now have one lens looking into the father that is incarnational because Jesus decided to do more than stay at a distance. He came near through the enfleshment and that enfleshment was not supposed to be a footnote to the fall of Adam. The fall of Adam is a footnote to the incarnation of the enfleshment of the word of God. So I, I, I talk about incarnation and what you mean. I just, I think it's important when we, when we say the incarnation, we think of candles and wreaths and these beautiful Christmas trees. Thank you, Lainey Gilbo. She's so awesome. These beautiful Christmas trees. I'm a Christmas fanatic. Like I am over the top. Christmas American Express card had smoke coming off of it. It's Christmas time, you know, just lo just loving love it going for it. But I, but now when I say incarnation, I see that someone from the world of perichoresis, somebody from the circle dance said, we will not have anybody in our image who can't find their way back into the union of this circle. They've lost their way. Functionally, they've lost their minds and we've got to go help them restore their identification because they've fallen out of the dignity of the image in which they were created. And we're not going to save them just from burning in hell. We're going to help them find their way back into the perfect union of the circle of perfect love. And they're going to learn to dance there. And that's the pressure of the year. And I think perfect love <laughs> requires incarnation. In other words, the manifestation of the uncreated God into the created dimension yeah, we yeah. inhabit required a full manifestation of what he had or has in that dimension, in this dimension, which is the incarnate, which is that's this is exactly who he is. Right. right. In flesh. Yes. So there's there's no there's no dichotomy. Right. There's no. Well, and that, that, yeah, that's a, a huge. But no, that is the total icon that's the total picture and anything else is not the total exactly. picture so which is which is to me what i talk about when i talk about the internal dichotomy of the good cop bad cop well yahweh is this way 
But Jesus is this way. And if you want love and you want compassion and you want tenderness, you go to Jesus. If you want fire and you want judgment and you want strength, you want power, you want authority, you go. No, the same measure of strength and power and authority and vigor and justice and judgment and righteousness is in Jesus. I think most people can go there. Where they can't go is then the same measure of tenderness and compassion and approachability is present in Yahweh. It's Paige's song. That's it. That's Safe exactly right. Safe in daddy's arms. Safe in daddy's arms. And that's the Abba revelation when we talk about the Abba revelation. And I think you, I think I would have come into this, and I'm, I'm probably still there, and say you, I, when I encountered you, you had one of the highest measures of the Abba revelation of anybody that I had ever been around. But here's the beauty. I, I, you and I have talked about this. That may be true, but I told him, I said, I could not have gotten seated right. in the that's revelation the piece. Without, without this relationship. That's the, that's the, the necessity of the apostolic. And, and then what's, what's beautiful, what's happening with him and everybody is, 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 is I'm, we've got a front row seat to watching this get incarnated in Damon Thompson as a son of Yahweh, not just the apostle. And that's been, I mean, you're transparent. Yeah, I think the huge. apostle thing has, the, the, the apostolic word is really important to me. The apostle word is really not. And you know me well enough for Absolutely. me to say that. I, I appreciate the apostolic function, but I'm, I'm not finding my way into being the apostle over this expression. I'm finding my way into childhood. That's it, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get to Wayland. Back there Me too. Yeah. at five pounds and completely cared for and completely nurtured. I mean, I can see my granddaughter Man. walking out the door and going, Papa. I can hear one on the phone. She can hear her in the background. She's talking to Shay Shay, but I can hear Papa, yeah. Pop, where's Papa? Yeah. And, and it's like the Holy Spirit oh. said, can I, can I so convert you Unless into childlikeness you again as a that child. it's just, just as unfettered as her papa. And it's interesting. So there's, a, there's an old song from an old movie that Sharon and I rewatched this year for the first time in 30 years. And it's a, it's a Hebrew Jewish movie set in a yeshiva. Um, uh, the name of it's called Yentl. It's a Barbara Streisand movie. Some of you may remember from years ago. But you know what the we're song is? We're not as old as you. <laughs> I'm sorry. No I Y'all were just about. in the mother's was womb. Was it on a reel? Yeah, yeah here we go. Sorry, <laughs> old I'm man sorry, up I'm here. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the song she sings at the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie is, is, is the question that's still burning in my heart. Papa, can you see me? Mm. Papa. And I think in the incarnation, that answer has been required, not as a once upon a time event 2,000 years right, ago, right. but as a mystery that's, that's still going that's on. It. I am that's still, it. I love what one of the mystical writers I've, I've, I've read this year who's really helped inform my journey says that, that the, the reality of Christ is a reality that fully interpenetrates mm. and intercirculates completely in this created dimension. Wow. Which, uh, you know, say uh, that again. Say, say that, that, that the Christ again. reality is it fully interpenetrates and intercirculates mm. in this created realm. Therefore, and I've begun to add to it, therefore, it's fully accessible. Yeah. So it's, it, it dealt in with this the, dimension, in this in dimension. This therefore it dealt time. with the abandonment thing. It yeah. was, then it became a perception issue, yeah. it became a consciousness yeah. issue that my consciousness was limited by some residue of abandonment right. through this past year. That's gotten into the light now where I'm seeing, gosh, that was just an illusion as yeah, you've been, you all along. That's so, it. so it really, he really, I, I used to say Putman, you remember that back when the sons of hope days, I would tell those guys, he's more here than we're here. Yeah. He really yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. And if we can slough off that edemic consciousness sure, sure. and what it taught us about, I mean, incorrectly about who he is, yeah. then, I'll, then I, that's where it gets to this long path thing with me. That maybe we're on the front end and maybe this year was that's a vital so piece to now throwing us into something that may take the next hundred years to get into Wayland's mm -hmm. conscience where he looks back and this, what we're talking about, right. he's so far into yeah. that. Yeah. He can see it. What yeah. I've not, what is, what I'm just now starting to see at 60, he's going to be able yeah, to see big. as a, as a small big. child. Yeah. The, what's been a struggle for me and for you at times to go come out of these two polarities of yeah. abandonment and the judicial view of God, that's going to be so far removed. I, I just remember a conversation I had with Taylor Martin uh, years ago. Taylor, you're watching this this morning, but Taylor looked at me and he said, 
I, I don't know what you mean by hopelessness. Yeah. And he does. He doesn't. No. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like that consciousness and what he was raised in, just in having a, a dad and mom, just like you, yeah. raised in a mom and dad, you, yeah. you know, your hopelessness did not come from your family of origin. It came from religion. Not. No, that's absolutely not. I was taught that later in life because I had an unbelievably trustworthy father who was absolutely good. And then I got introduced by way of inherited theology and by and by, really by way of a people who did, didn't know a lot doctrinally. So they had to feign a lot of certitude about certain things that they didn't really understand because my, you know, the, I, I used to say Pentecostal theology is an oxymoron, you know, because it's just not, we're just, didn't, we didn't have a lot of theology. We just felt a lot, you know? And so I think what the Lord is now doing, you know, you talked about the polarity of, you know, you have this, you had this liberal orientation. I had this legalistic orientation. They both led to hopelessness while we're having that pre-service or pre, pre speaking conversation Paige is up here singing about being held in daddy's arms. And I said, she doesn't, she doesn't struggle with either end of that. So their first witness of that is in their twenties having children that are experiencing the perfect love of Christ that has cast out all fear and it has created this infectious hope by way of the efficacy of the perfect love of God. And for me, it much of it comes down to uh, Jesus wasn't taking a beating from his father to keep his father from beating his younger brothers, you and I. He wasn't just being a good big brother. His dad's going to beat the hell out of somebody, and I'm going to take the lick. I, we would not have said it that way, but that's what I believed. I, I, Matt Putman shaking his head at me right now. That is what we believed, that you, have, you had an angry, abusive, retributive, punitive smiter of a God who had to, by way of justice, beat the hell out of somebody for the condition of the planet and, and, and Jesus said, beat me instead of them. And that's why I'm in this real place of distinction in my own heart between the cross and the crucifixion. That the crucifixion is what we did to Jesus. The cross is the picture of the perfect love of God that is, ready? God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Where was the father in the crucifixion? He was in Christ while we were putting our evil hands on the Son of God, God in enters into that suffering, that, and that's kenosis to me. That's why I can say it's been a kenotic year. Kenosis, what we mean when we say that Jesus emptied himself, that, that literally he said, there's nothing in me I won't pour out to have you back. And to me, the kenosis of the emptying of himself was him saying, there's no price I won't pay to put you back in this circle. You were born from perichoresis. You were born for perichoresis and you have functionally lost your mind. Thank you, Baxter Kruger. And you can't find your way back into this circle. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you that perfect love is so perfect. There's no price. Perfect love won't pay kenosis i'm going to empty myself in order to bring you back into the circle so you can experience the fullness of the love of christ that is made manifest in the mystery of the incarnation you're helping me see what i saw in part the first image i saw once you sent us home from the last carolina revival you said y'all we're going to take a break we were they were doing the shutdown yeah four days later i was walking on my driveway and i saw a partial rainbow in the sky and I began to, to, to see what then I saw was a broken circle. Uh, incomplete. Yeah. yeah. And, and that image off and on has haunted me, mm -hmm. frustrated me. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What are you trying to show me? And ultimately, by year's end, as we got back to something we mentioned years ago a little bit, which is the perichoresis mystery, was that that was the circle that I've been trying to show you all along, and there was something about your consciousness That's broken. That, that broken. You can't yeah. see it. Right. And now it's now we. And I love what you said earlier. We have now come full circle. That's yeah. all over my notes now. It, so that and it's the consciousness shift has got to go full circle to mm -hmm. put us in the circle that's always been here, but we couldn't perceive it because right. of a consciousness problem. Right. That's right. Well, we didn't, have, we didn't have a God who was in Christ working, selling the world to himself. We had a God who was abusing his son 
And, and, and then we get to how will he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, not also freely with him, give us all things. And so that, 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 you know, boy, I'm about to take a big leap. I wish, I wish this was being pre-taped so we could potentially edit this part out. But, uh, I was driving, uh, yesterday we were on a road trip with the family and we were coming home and I passed by a Goodwill, Goodwill store. And the Lord said, you have some hangups concerning my goodwill. And so I end up in this meditation for hours that honestly agitated me. I had to do the whole repent to the family for being snappy at everybody on the road trip. I did. I literally did because this agitated me because I'm dealing with some ingrained anxiety that comes by way of inheriting a theology that says whatever God wills is good because God willed it. This is what I was taught, which is the, which is the Calvinistic thread. I wasn't fundamentally caught, taught full-blown reformed theology, but the leaven of it was certainly present. You couldn't do the legalism thing I was raised in without it. And so there was a lot of, of that was in there, which was, you know, which was Jonathan Edwards who brought to America this influence of Calvin by way of, you know, the sinners in the hands of an angry God deal that, that really was championed in the world that I grew up in and even in the theological world that I taught in that was championed and it's extraordinarily sad, but it's true. And this is what God said. He said, you believe that what I will is good because I willed it, but you don't necessarily believe I only will good things. You can file things away. This may be getting a little too heady for people, but you can file things away under this sovereignty notion that says God, it has to be good because God willed it, even though there seems to be nothing good about it versus there's an adversary who's willing evil things. And he has that authority by way of the abdication of a group of people who have not been perfected in love that need to come to a place where we're able to put on the adversary what needs to be put on the adversary and quit by way of sovereign, sovereignty blaming things on God that God had nothing to do with. And it led me to a quote, actually a, 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 a good friend of mine uh, sent me this. Um, one of the brightest theological students I ever taught was a young man by the name of Casey Doss and he pastors in Knoxville, Tennessee. And he sent me this uh, on December the 8th and it's a quote by a guy by the name of David Bentley Hart. Let me read this to you. A child dying an agonizing death from diphtheria, a young mother ravaged by cancer, tens of thousands of Asians swallowed in an instant by the sea, millions murdered in death camps and forced famines. Our faith is in a God who has come to rescue his creation from the absurdity of sin and the emptiness of death. And so we are permitted to hate these things with a perfect hatred. Watch this. As for comfort, when we seek it, I can imagine none greater than the happy knowledge that when I see the death of a child, I do not see the face of God, but the face of his enemy. It is a faith that has set us free from optimism and taught us hope instead. Let me read this part again. Right, let me read this. As a comfort, when we seek it, I can imagine none greater than the happy knowledge that when I see the death of a child, I do not see the face of God, but the face of his enemy. And it is a faith that has set us free from optimism and taught us hope instead. That's David Bentley Hart, the uh, Orthodox theologian, brilliant Orthodox theologian from the doors of the sea, the question, where was God in the tsunami? Versus the ingrained anxiety that comes as a result of saying God is in charge of this pandemic and 350,000 people are dead as date and more are going to die. And what we're going to do is we're going to have to say, it doesn't look good, but it has to be good because it's God's will. And I feel something shifting on the inside of me to say, why can't we give darkness the credit that darkness is supposed to get for dark things happening? Because in him, there is no darkness whatsoever. 
He is light, and in him there is no darkness whatsoever. He is light, and in him doesn't mean he doesn't use darkness, doesn't mean he can't redeem darkness, but let's don't make him the author of darkness if he is actually the author of light, and he's looking to bring light into this darkness, and that shift in consciousness has got to happen, or you and I will keep Ab, listen to this phrase, abdicating our responsibility as image bearers. We are image bearers. We're abdicating our responsibility. And I'm not, I'm not winning here yet, but I think we're on the path of a group of people perfected enough in perfect love, in the perfect love of Christ that we're able to say the incarnation was the down payment on the promise that you and I were going to be able to say, Christ in me is the hope of glory. Yeah, the problem, whew, I just can react to so much of that. The problem is imperfected love yeah. in the sons and yeah, daughters. That That's why right creation's here. groaning. Yeah. What's, what's creation groaning for? My perfection, exactly. my maturity, yeah. my son place. And when we say perfect in, in right. the sense of what that word means, we're not talking about mistake free. We're talking about wholeness. We're talking about a completeness, even the Ephesians 4 narrative where we all come into the image of the stature of the perfect God by way of the apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastoral, and teaching gifts. We all come into this perfect expression. The idea of their perfect is completeness, which could be the broken rainbow. That what it really is, is participation in the circle of perfect love. You dancing to the dance of the rhythms of the harmony of perfect love. One, fully giving canonically, fully giving yourself by what agape, other-centered self-giving love to another. And he's saying, I'm trying to, I want you in this measure of union. This is what you were born so for. in essence, what he showed me this year was, hey, Johnson, there's still a piece of you outside of the no, circle. That's right. That's right. And I need to, to I share need the part about you're, you're a commentator looking yeah, into the circle. I, I, yeah. It's like one of my bends is I can sit in a revival meeting and have sit on the back row and take great notes about what's going all around me and miss out on the very dance that's in the room, yeah. which I then become a reporter reporting what's going on. Mm -hmm. I, I, this bends in my quiet time. Yeah. Uh, times I have to just close my, get, get the pen out of my hand. Yeah. And it's like, he says, Shh, stop it. Yeah. You're, you're trying to tell or report on this versus being immersed into mm -hmm. it. And, and he's coming for that. These moments where, where we get so wrecked, yeah, because we're in here. Yeah. And that is where the hope of the cosmos is. Yeah. It's not in a in a in a in a God who, in my worldview, is removed in distance. It's like he's screaming. Well, I, you talk about some radical stuff you've heard. I heard this whisper this year. It's, <laughs> correct me right here in front of everybody. It's OK. <laughs> he can't do it without us that's big i think that's huge which, which sounds like what are you saying he's not um, omnipowerful or all that no 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 perfect love requires incarnation it required the christ mystery and yes. now it requires the further christ mystery in you and i so it requires incarnation so in some way this gets to, this is what makes me want to run around the room mm -hmm. at the end of this mm -hmm. year is it requires my participation requires yeah and which then means I am essential to the restoration of the cosmos in a real small way. And, I, and I'm okay being small. Which, but, but how do you miss that? Romans 8. Exactly. The groaning and travailing for the manifestation. All of creation eagerly awaits the unveiling, the manifestation of the sons of God. Which gets right back into it. Can I trust he is love. Yeah. Because, because my, my yeah. answer to in part, one thing I also heard this year was a, a rephrasing of Romans 8, 28, which is, it was real simple. It was childlike simple. It was Johnson, love always works. Hmm. Perfect love always so works, good. which then means it always works for good. Yeah. But the problem, the hiccup is, can perfect love find the agency in which it can express its mm -hmm. perfection. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the abdication of responsibility part of it where, you know, we've seen dominion outside of the framework of perichoresis, which that's the world you operated in, that, which yeah. created this dangerous sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. But if, if all authority, if the healing of the sick, 
the raising of the dead, the cleansing of the leper, the casting out of the devil that I was trained we're moving towards. We haven't gotten to yet, not because we needed a greater understanding of how to have a good confession and how to operate and move in the gifts of the spirit. It was the circle dance that was missing for me. The broken circle. For me, it was the, me it, it, without my participation in that circle of perfect love, the expansion of the goodness of the love of God made manifest within that circle can't be experienced by the culture at large. So my, my, my responsibility then becomes to participate in the Zoe of this circle dance to the point that it begins to create this magnetic force that begins to call people into the light of the life of the mystery of the perfect love of Christ that we're living and walking in even in the middle of a pandemic. Which gets us to the resistance thing. Yes, that, and that's the key. That, 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 yeah, it's yeah. weird how yeah, we, that, we, that's we, key to me. Because, um, because this has been a year of restrictions. And I've watched people. <laughs> I've watched, I got, I'm too very careful not to go here further than I want to go here. I have watched people buck against these restrictions as if they're communism. You know, if someone tells me I'm not going to put a mask, my right not to put a mask on. You know, yes, yes, it is. You can stay home and not wear a mask, and nobody's going to come to your door and beat on your door and make you put a mask on. But I'll put a mask on if it let me go to dinner. <laughs> I'm tired of eating at home. I want to go somewhere and eat a good meal. If I need to put a mask on, and even if it's ignorant because I have to walk from the door of the restaurant to the table with the mask on just in order to take the mask back off, I'm okay with all of that because I don't, first of all, I don't live in the realm of conspiracy theory. You know, and, and we've got the whole faith over fear thing. I'm going to get me a T-shirt that says reality over conspiracy theories and wear that one. And you can wear your faith over fear T-shirt just because I don't have to go to YouTube to find out what's actually happening in the world. You know, it's it's just not that. And so if, 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 if you can get over that hump and you get over that hurdle, then you begin to look at how God has historically used restrictive seasons. There, there was no room for him in the inn. Right. Yes. Okay. There was no, there was his access to the place you would have wanted to have a baby was restricted so that prophecy could be fulfilled by way of a season of restriction. Yeah. And if I can... And, and, and restriction creates all kind of resistance. Yes, yes. And so it then requires, what, what am I doing with my resistance? Right. Am I getting further defensive? No, right. Well, bro, let me tell you what I'm, you know, yeah. versus can I process, what's my resistance all about in light of this restriction? That then has ushered me into a greater yeah. place of liberty because yeah. it, it only manifests another dimension of darkness right, right, me, right. around the restriction exactly. that then produces exactly. resistance. Exactly. So I've had to process for me, it became, is there a seed of lawlessness in me? Is, is there a seed? In law, and I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm not, uh, if, 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 we, if our rights start legitimately being infringed on, we can have another conversation. But the people who have argued these restrictions, I heard the same thing over seatbelts. I had people tell me no government official can tell me that I have to wear a seatbelt. And you know what we're all doing now? Wearing seatbelts. Matter of fact, my vehicle will harass me to the point of anger if I don't. I, I have a ranch, which means I'm in my vehicle at times driving, getting out, opening a gate, getting out, opening another gate, getting out, opening another gate. And, and, and the, the cows and horses, the, the, my main concern is the cows and horses don't get out. It's not that in that ranch I need to wear a seatbelt, but I've got to wear the seatbelt because the car is going to communicate to me that I need to wear a seatbelt. But seatbelts have saved a lot of lives. But I heard, especially from the religious establishment, the same type of argument that I'm hearing around having to wear a mask is the same thing I heard around people having to wear a seatbelt. And you're just like, listen, I don't think we're going have to wear masks for the rest of our lives. I, I really don't. I'm, I'm in a hope that we're progressing in a good direction. All I care about in the middle of all of this is that I did not miss the mystery of a place of internal wholeness that was supposed to come by way of restriction. And when I think of restriction, I think about God ordained restrictions. You may eat of every tree in the garden, but don't eat that one. 
Now, was, was that to torment them that something was restricted? Or was it to teach them that everything you need is in what's available, even in a culture where something had to be restricted? It's the tithe. Is it because God wants you to show that you're disciplined enough that you can do without 10% of your money? Or is part of that belong to him so that he can then put a blessing on the whole that would not come without you having a canonic willingness to empty part of what's been given to you in order to have access to what's greater? And I begin, when I begin to think about this, I, I immediately, and this hit me early this morning, building a fire for Tammy before I left to go to my office. Immediately, the first thing that hit me is Hannah. Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, who would become the mother of Samuel, desperately wants to give Elkanah a son. She can't have a child. 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 The scripture says God kept her from having a child. Was her desire to have a child righteous? Right? Of course. Now, there's another problem. Cultural disclaimer, Elkanah's got another wife named Paniah who can have babies like Paige Putman. Like, 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 like I just had one and I'm having another one and I'm having another one and I'm having another one. And Paniah is like, you know, there's just babies everywhere and Hannah's going, what about me? What about me? What about me? What was Hannah dealing with? Hannah was dealing with a season of restriction. What was the season of restriction intended to produce? Well, let me ask you this question. Name one of the children of Paniah. Because that that did not come by way of restriction is not notable enough to impact history. But if you and I can see the season of restriction carefully, what prophetic, I mean, appropriately, what prophetic Samuel is about to be born that is going to bring about a revolution in the way, in the way of the realm of the prophetic? I believe the prophetic world of revival, if it can get very Christocentric in its thinking right now, this season of restriction is about to birth a Samuel. Or we could have just kept doing business as usual and we could have reproduced and reproduced and reproduced and not reproduced anything notable. But when you've been through a season of restriction, what comes out of the womb on the other side of the season of restriction is notable enough that Samuel gets handed back to Eli and becomes a second chance for an immobile, blind, religious spirit that had lost Hophni and Phinehas, his two sons. Hophni and Phinehas had been raised with a spirit of entitlement Entitlement. This is what we're dealing with in, in the framework of the church, raised with a sense of entitlement that everything that was going on in there was to benefit them personally. By way of that, they die. By the time Samuel comes onto the scene, this is amazing. Eli is immobile and he is blind and he's sitting in a pseudo seat of honor inside of the temple. So when Hannah, watch this, walks into the temple to pray for God to give her a son, she's in there wailing in hope. And the wail of hope was so offensive to Eli that Eli almost throws the mother of his next chance out of the room. And that's, consciousness. that's consciousness. So when he hears that wail, he hears she's drunk. And she was, but she'd been drinking hope. She was intoxicated with the hope that on the other side of restriction, God was going to let her birth something so notable that it could reform the injustice that was going on even within the house of God that Eli was the principal governor of. But Eli had become blind. It's a picture that he lost his vision. He had become immobile, which is a sense that, a sense that he had no willingness to change. He had no willingness to move from another position. He was receiving a pseudo Honor out of that seat. What's the word you use to describe that seat? The, uh, one translation says he sat in his customary seat. Customary seat. And that's what we're in. We're in we, we, where we are, we're in institutionalism. It's, it's, for me, it's replacing the word evangelicalism. And it's becoming the institutional church that has lost vision, has lost willingness to change, is sitting in a pseudo seat of authority by way of entitlement. And here's drunk Hannah over here on hope. And, what, and, and this is what's going to happen. If we're not careful, we're going to take that hope and we're going to cast it out versus saying what's actually happening on the inside of Hannah is she is birthing a new son for fathers that messed it up with a previous generation of people. 
Samuel comes back into Eli's life and becomes the hope of transformation. Samuel becomes this prophet with this horn of oil that ultimately finds his way to Dahavid, beloved identity, anoints David that becomes the progenitor of the line that will produce the Christ. And none of that happens if Hannah doesn't do the right thing with the season of restriction. In the middle of restriction, I believe Hannah came into an increased revelation that God was going to do something significant on the inside of her, even if she had to go through a significant season and period of restriction. And I, I want to, I wanna, from the seat of a father, I want to help people who will listen to this all over the world say, watch what's about to be born out of a season of restriction. Because there are people who have learned about the love of God in me, learned about the love of God. We have had a, a total, absolute, complete shift in consciousness as it relates to the nature of God. The circle that was broken is now being unbroken, is being perfected. We're coming into a place of wholeness. And I believe that some prophetic Samuels are about to be born. And on the other side of the birth of Samuel, you're gonna see the ordination of a new type of leader that operates in beloved identity that's going to ultimately usher a manifestation of Christ into the culture that's unlike anything we've seen. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking this, I don't know if I'm saying it effectively, but I'm, I'm taking this whole season of restriction and I'm peeling my eyes for the Samuels that are about to be born, for the prophetic voices that are about to be born that are saying, I couldn't do much ministry wise for a year, but I could sit alone and stare into the face of the Father until I began to dare to believe I was so beloved that my name could be Hephzibah because he showed delight in me. And then the land becomes Beulah through this transformation. And I think we'll look back on this 2020 season and we'll see the restriction as an opportunity for us to come into a measure of beloved identity, for us to, to accept the Abba revelation to the point that it created a new consciousness in us. So I'm, I look at the restriction now and I, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm like you, I, I'm ready for be able to go everywhere and do everything, but I would not trade what has happened in my internal garden in this season that I don't, I honestly think, let me say it like this. I honestly think there was a Panaya in me having so many babies. It was working. It was popping. It was going. It was happening that I would have just kept on his business as usual. And the Lord said, I'd like to hide you away for a season and restrict you because there's a Samuel in you. There, there's, there's one in you that's going to anoint the Dahavid, beloved identity, that's going to rule and reign, that's going to deal with the giants in the land, that, 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 that praying and fasting and decreeing has not dealt with the giants in the land, but beloved identity will deal with the giants in the land. And there's a generation coming that are not going to wrestle with the dichotomy, uh, the, the pendulum that you and I have that swung between these consciousness. And, and really like I see in Paige and like you, you prophetically even see what happened even more so in a Wayland who was raised now by parents who have been liberated from the legalistic consciousness or from the liberal consciousness into the place of God is not austere. God is not ambiguous. God is not retributive. All of his judgments are restorative. And if you make a restorative act, a punitive act, then you actually miss the purpose of the judgment. Yeah. That, and hence the necessity of the need for the shift. Yeah. I, while you were talking, I just felt like there are some leaders yes, that are it. listening to this or are going to listen to this who are caught right in the middle of that pressure to stay in that customary place yeah. and, and inadvertently then become a, an Eli voice to their generation Ooh, versus letting the restriction you are currently in take you into a place of processing resistance that really does take the blinders, more than the blinders, but it really just... I tell you a passage I saw this morning, and, I, and you've spoken on this, and I'm taking it a little bit in a different direction, but it's the, the story in the New Testament where Jesus had to touch the guy's eyes twice. Right. And the first time, you know, and, and, I know, and I may be forgetting some of what you taught, but yeah. here's what I saw, was the second touch was the shift of consciousness. Exactly. That at that point, his eyesight was liberated and healed so that he saw differently. Yes. And it's, I think that there's that, that huge potential going on right now, particularly with leaders. Yeah. If they can let the thing <clears throat> Come on, go. Man. Yes. And if it implodes, it implodes and, and resist the pressure 
to keep the old thing going on. I and, and, you big. know, and I, I know there's I a whole lot big. more you can probably, but I felt that when you were saying that, that there are some, some, some Eli's who have the opportunity. It's not too late. It's not too it, late. To make that shift, yeah. to come out of that place, to let Yahweh do what he needs to do so that some Samuels can be, and, mm. the, and, the, and that's huge because we're sitting out here seeing it. Yeah. I'm seeing that. I, I tell you what else I saw was kind of humorous was I saw Weston back in revival about a month ago. I mean, a year ago, one That's night. That's their he second got, son. That's the yeah, Putman's second son. Yeah. <laughs> and he got stripped of his clothes. I don't know if you remember it. And he was oh, running yeah. around here in his diaper yeah. and just eating. And I would have thought, what would, what would have happened? You tell me in an old Pentecostal oh, holiness God, church yes. if, if that child had been it's, permitted. Exactly. To, you know, and what would have happened in this church if somebody had said something to that child exactly. about that? Something would have risen up on the inside of me as a father to say, no, here is the safest place in the world for him to run around in his diaper and smear goldfish into the carpet. Now, this is the holy sanctuary of Almighty God. You can't smear goldfish. No, he's going to be at home in Abba's house, and he's going to know he's at home, and he's going to know that he's loved, and he's going to know that he's celebrated, and he's not going to have that thing that you and I had, which is looking around continually to see when we're going to get slapped on the back of the head again for not doing everything exactly the way way that we're supposed to. And, and this thing is, is and I, I'm with you, I concur. If, if leaders can make the shift, then the end result of, of, of the entitled institutional church will not be the death of Hophni and Phinehas. It'll be the birth of a Samuel that can bring about a redemption and really move Israel into her prophetic identity to the point that, that both Saul and David are able to prophetically be identified by this Samuel, who is the secondary consequence of a season of extreme resistance, extreme restriction. Even while you're just speaking that, I, 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 I don't know who this is for or where this word's going to fall. But there's, there's a father out there, there's a leader out there that literally their children right now are a Hophni and a Phinehas. See it, see it. And, yeah. and if see they and can receive it. this yeah. word, then, yeah. then an identificational Thank transformation you, will Thank take you, place. Lord. And the Hophni Phinehas thing is going to be cast off and they're going to be, you, uh, they're going to be re-identified as Thank a Samuel. I feel Let's that. Let's pray over them. Father, I thank you right now that, that, that the, even the thing in us as leaders that doesn't know what to do with seasons of wandering in sons. I thank you, Father, that we are going to accept the Abba revelation, but also operate in the Abba identification, in the Abba nature that continually watches the road. I pray for the rule of the law of mercy to begin to be seen in the nation and begin to be seen within our church systems, even this institutionalization where we've become blind and immobile as leaders. I thank you that the spirit of Samuel is is being born on the other side of a season of restriction. And out of this restriction, we're going to see a new prophetic hearing begin to be birthed. We're going to see a new prophetic voice begin to be birthed. And out of that, the ordination, the anointing, the smearing with oil of those who have been immersed in the beloved identity are going to begin to produce a progeny that produced a manifestation of the mystery of the love of Christ in a way that the culture has not been seen before. Father, I feel the arms of the circle of perichoresis wide open and inviting not filled with judgment not filled with wrath but filled with inclusion and hope and a hunger for union let the incarnation the enfleshment be the proof that there's no price that you would not pay to see that we would find our way back into the union that we were designed for I thank you that even in this season I feel the Lord saying this that the system is being judged that the instant institutionalism is that that's being judged by the perfect love of God an institutional religion that is keeping people from the mystery of the love of God made manifest in the person of Christ is now coming into a collision with the revelation of the Abba nature and the Abba revealed in Jesus is the Abba who actually exists and on the other side of this we're going to see transformation the songs are starting to shift but they've not shifted the way they're going to shift in the days to come he's going to give us a new hymnology and we're going to begin to see lyrical expression come out of the revelation of who Abba actually is that is going to set us free from the sense of futility that came with the ingrained anxiety of our impoverished western theology that the legal orientation of western theology 
cannot live through the collision with the Abba revelation that is made manifest in the person of Jesus. I thank you. I thank you for a mercy movement, Father. I thank you for a movement of mercy coming that's going to cause prodigals to return back to Abba's house by the tens of thousands. I'm praying, God, for those that got disenfranchised, those that got were del- became delusional by way of the rules and the regulations of the religion of their day, of the institutionalized church. I thank you that they're going to encounter the Abba revelation. Maybe it's in the light of the eyes of a beloved one who knows nothing other than the Abba revealed in Jesus. And we're going to see them begin to come home for parents that are believing for their children to come home. I release a spirit of grace to begin to come home even through holiday seasons where things were tumultuous. The Lord said seeds were planted of a difference in you, mom and dad, that you're not going to judge the son and daughter who's struggling in a particular area. You're not going to cast them out and you're not going to cast them off, but you're going to let the love of Abba begin to be revealed through your approach, begin to be revealed through your approachability and your tenderness in Jesus name. I thank you, Jesus, that the incarnation, the enfleshment was not just to save us from hell, but to fix our broken perspective of who your dad is to fix our broken perspective of who your dad is. And we receive of that today. I thank you that we're being immersed in that revelation and that this season of restriction will not be wasted. This season of restriction will not be forfeited, but we're going to come out of this with a fresh fire in our belly to live in the perfect union of the circle dance of father, son, and spirit all the days of our life. All the days of our life in the name of Yeshua. Are you seeing anything else, JD, that you feel like I you just need saw to point one out? More, one more thing that. Thank you, that Lord. I, the, the revelation of the full circle and, and, and the perichoresis, the circle dance that takes place inside of that circle, it's, it's come real clear to me, and you've, you've spoken on this a lot this year, and that it's really kind of. I've actually given the circle a name for me. Okay. And it's, it's just, it's the name for a Hebrew letter, but it's also the name for a Hebrew word. And I call it the Samach circle. Okay. And the word Samach really is one of the Hebrew words for joy. Mm. And you've said a number of times. It's been Tammy's th- biggest word. Really? In this pandemic. Okay. Well, here joy. we go. Yeah, yeah. Then I feel like <clears throat> the mark of the inheritance of being in the circle is a manifestation of authentic wow, joy wow. at a level there's the contagious part that of the it. cosmos has been waiting on yeah, because it's on. it's it's the joy that is the mark of Haba, Hadavid that ultimately it, yeah. it, uh, the, it's not that we got to make people dance is that we can't you cannot <laughs> yes, not, you can't not, not dance, dance. Yeah. in the level of reidentification and oneness the level of oneness inside of that circle so I see mm. as a manifestation of the full circle this eruption this Come this, on, this of, joy. Uh, of joy Come on. Uh, well, it is. A I, I receive that. I need that. I need to hear that. I receive that because this is the, the, uh, so much of the responsibility of leading during this season has been so challenging. And then we, we, we lost a dear friend. He's, he's not, he's not lost. He's not lost. He, he's more alive than we are right now, but the difficulty and challenge of, of Harvey's passing and the way that has done some things in me emotionally and the challenge of the responsibility of I want those stories to turn out differently and I don't want to come up with some sovereignty spin that 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 lets me or God off the hook that's not he's, he's not afraid of this but we've got to be able to go in to dark situations with a measure of light and with a measure of joy that becomes contagious enough that it, it brings transformation and we're not there but I think we're on the path and we say that a lot. I'm, we are not at the destination, but I'm more convinced than I ever have been before that we're on the path. So don't be discouraged yeah, in the good. midst of a that's horrible good. pandemic that we're not seeing <clears throat> tangible, observable fruit like we wanted to. Because, I mean, I remember we prayed hard that this thing would be turned back yeah, and be exactly and for that's whatever it, reason. It hasn't been, but yeah. I, maybe it's for this. I mean, yeah. part of yeah. what's happening in this is a deeper revelation Mm -hmm. of the circle and the reality of perichoresis. In other words, the blinders are coming off more. We're even now coming through something horrible. I feel the highest level of hope. And then then almost, it feels almost blasphemous, but it's true to talk about joy. Yeah. And you know, but, but yet out of that, can there be a level of oneness Mm. 
let, let me say one more piece because I felt yeah, like well, this and is I, good. Yeah. There was a lot of hype about the conjunction of the stars on December 21st. Right, and I, right. I don't want to poo-poo that because that was, that was wonderful. Yeah. But I got too much of an astronomer, astronomer <laughs> in me. Here's the deal. The whole thing was a mirage. Those two stars were half of a billion miles that, apart. They looked close. They, they looked were not close, close. But they were not. And I heard the Holy Spirit whispered, I am yearning for a more perfect union, wow. which is in the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. But I, I, I don't know what to make, but I heard that clear as a wow. bell. And all of a sudden here at the end of this meeting, I'm, I'm hearing a it now, more perfect that, that I'm after the real deal, mm. a, a real, a real. Not a mirage. Not a mirage. Of union. Yeah, not something that's, uh, yeah. they're half a billion miles apart, yeah. but from yeah. my van, oh, that looks, that's the dog and pony show. Yeah. Boy, ain't that cold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, I'm, mm. No, it's what, what's going to be a And I think that one. scares me about the message of beloved identity, that it becomes a hashtag. That, that leaders were so good at <clears throat> riding the coattails of what somebody else is experiencing because we say, oh, that's what people like to hear. That, that's, and and I, I just want to caution us that we, we, this thing has required um, a measure of naked vulnerability and transparency that has sucked. You don't want to do this in front of the world, man, you know, but, but you can't, I can't experience this publicly differently than I'm experiencing privately because it would make me look better as a leader to have this all polished and buttoned up. But your willingness to go there, and I've said this to you before, his willingness to go there is giving us permission to go there. And I don't think that could happen to the depths it's happening if you have not been that, even right now, that transparent, that exposing. I mean, it, there is a frequency that's coming through him now as dad that, that infects this house to those who can embrace the restriction, stay open through the resistance, and receive this deeper immersion into the circle. It's, uh, well, I love what you're saying right now, and I receive it. I receive it as a word of the Lord to me that you find your, your way into a place of hope and joy that you've not known before. And, okay. and the pandemic is worse now. Right. And I'll say this about my Ben. I, Sharon and I talk. I look at her and I say, Sharon, I said, you have naturally effervesced in joy all your life. Tammy, too. It's frustrating. Not me. It's frustrating. I'm like, how, you just, like, can, you, can you be unhappy? <laughs> yeah, but I would not be the guy that they would pick out and go, that guy's full of joy. No, no. Until no, no, now. Yeah, right. Until now. And it's a supernatural it. infusion because that's not been, that, yeah, I'm that's so big. It's man. just, well, I receive that. I believe that's the, I believe that's the sort of the bow on this morning. We're going to do some more of this in the future, but uh, I hope it's impacting you the way it's impacting us. But I definitely feel that there is a measure of being enfolded into the perfect love of Christ that brings immeasurable hope and immeasurable joy, fullness of joy fullness of joy. My joy may be in you that your joy may be full. That's the participation in perichoresis. So we love you. We bless you. Thank you, JD, for everything behind the scenes that, that you do to cause this house to be what it is and cause this family to be what it is. It doesn't go unnoticed or it doesn't go unappreciated. That's for sure. I love you dearly. I'm thankful for you. For Shay Shay, thank you for sharing this man with me uh, all, all hours of the day and night. It's an awesome thing. We love you. We bless you. And uh, take this if this is impacting you share it with somebody just get the word out that God is good and Jesus meant what he said when he said if you've seen me you've seen the father